In the previous video of this series, you saw how the employee class inherited all of the methods and properties of the person class. Which makes sense because an employee is a type of person. Then the employee class was extended with some extra properties which are specific to an employee, namely the job role and salary. You then saw how the casual employee class inherited all of the methods and properties of the employee class, including what came from the person class. A casual employee is a type of employee. The casual employee class was then extended with a property specific to a casual employee, namely agency contact. We can represent this inheritance hierarchy with a diagram like this. In fact, if we want to be more explicit, we could use a UML class diagram like this. UML stands for the Unified Modeling Language. UML is a diagrammatic notation often used by software designers to describe object-oriented applications. Each box is a class, at the top of which is the name of the class. Underneath the name is a list of properties. A plus sign means it's public. The section under that contains a list of methods. Notice that the Save Details method appears multiple times because each version has a different set of parameters, that is, each version has a different method signature, indicating that these are overloads of the same method. Three dots mean there are other properties and methods, but we choose not to list them. Class diagrams can contain as much or as little detail as you like. The arrows indicate inheritance. So the diagram clearly shows that the casual employee has an agency contact, a job role, salary, first name, last name, and three overloads of the save details method. You can imagine that there are lots of other properties specific to an employee, which we could write code for in the employee class, such as the name of their supervisor, the date they started working at the cattery, how many years of experience they have working with cats, their cat care qualification, and whatever other properties a cattery employee might have. If all of these extra properties were coded into the employee class, the casual employee would automatically inherit them. That's the power of inheritance. To put it another way, any public properties that make up the public interface of the employee class automatically become part of the interface of the casual employee class. Make sure you're comfortable with this idea before you continue. If not, review the other videos in the series. Now, arguably, the code you can see here is flawed because I've put a salary property in the employee class. Why? Well, it comes down to how you define the word salary. A full-time permanent employee would probably have a salary, a fixed amount paid each month into their bank account according to their annual salary. For example, if their annual salary was £24,000, they would get £2,000 per calendar month, minus deductions like tax. A casual employee, on the other hand, is more likely to be paid for the hours they work each week or month, multiplied by an hourly rate. For example, if they work 25 hours in a month at £10 an hour, they would get £250. But our casual employee has inherited the salary property, which is inappropriate. There's an important point to be made about inheritance here. A subclass can't selectively inherit just some of the methods and properties of its superclass. It will inherit them all. In an attempt to put this right, I'm going to rename the salary property in the employee class to something more generic. Let's say rate of pay. So this change is now automatically inherited by the casual employee class. Here it is on our class diagram. When I assign a value to the rate of pay property for a permanent employee, I need to be aware 
that it will be their annual salary. When I assign a value to rate of pay for a casual employee, I need to be aware that it will be their hourly rate. Here's a neat little feature in VB.net that I can use to make this clear in the front end. Let's rebuild the class library and see how it looks in the front end. I have a compiler error now because there is no longer a salary property. It's called rate of pay. And there it is. And you can see the description I've put on there as well, making it clear how to use this. Beatrix, who is a permanent employee, is paid a salary of £10,000 per annum. Mervyn is paid £10 per hour. I'll just tidy it up a little bit. And I think I'll give Beatrix a pay rise. Now, arguably, a better approach would be to have an employee class with all of the properties that are common to any type of employee, start date, supervisor, qualification, but not salary. Then to have a separate permanent employee class with a salary and a separate casual employee class with an hourly rate and the number of hours worked. Both types of employees would then inherit from the more generic employee class. Nevertheless, let's proceed with the original approach. My casual employee now needs an hours worked property so it can be used along with their rate of pay to calculate their wages. I could use a single but I'm going to use an integer because in this category you can only work a whole number of hours. Here's the change in my UML class diagram. Now, let's talk about polymorphism, perhaps the least well understood feature of object oriented programming. I'm going to code up a calculate monthly pay method in the employee class. This will take the rate of pay, which for a permanent employee is their annual salary, and divide it by 12 to get a monthly amount. Decimal is the best data type when you're working with money. I could of course include code to make deductions for tax and pension contributions. In fact, the result of the calculation would probably get saved to a payroll database and then trigger a bank payment. But that's beside the point. For the purposes of this demonstration, my method will just return the result of a simple calculation. Here's an updated class diagram. My casual employee class has automatically inherited the new method. But what the method does is totally inappropriate for a casual employee. I want the casual employee class to have a calculate monthly pay method too but I want it to do something completely different, namely multiply the rate of pay by the number of hours worked. I want the casual employee class to replace or override the calculate monthly pay method that it inherited. To do this, I need to indicate that the superclass method is overridable. Now I can override it in the subclass using the overrides keyword. Notice that the most crucial part of the calculation is different for the employee and the casual employee. Let's see what happens in the front end. There's the method call for the permanent employee. 
and there it is for the casual employee. A little bit of tidying up of the output. Beatrix is paid a salary of £25,000 per annum. Beatrix earned, well, <laughs> about £2,000 this month. I could do with wrapping up that method call in a format function to get rid of some of those decimal places. Mervyn is paid £10 per hour and Mervyn earned £0 this month. I think the problem here is that Mervyn hasn't worked any hours. Let's fix that. That's better. And Mervyn's made some money as well. So, what we have here are two different forms of an employing object behaving differently when a method with the same name is called. Two different types of employee have the same interface, but they implement it in different ways. We call this polymorphism. Literally, poly means many and morph means form. To put it more simply, an example of polymorphism is when a subclass overrides a method that it inherited from a superclass. Here's an updated class diagram. The simple fact that the same method appears in the superclass and the subclass indicates that the subclass has overridden it. If overriding a method is an example of polymorphism, What's another example of polymorphism? Another example of polymorphism is when a subclass overloads an inherited method. In the previous video, you saw how to overload a method within the same class by creating multiple variations, each with a unique method signature. Well, it's also possible for a subclass to overload a method that it inherited. A subclass can have its own extra variations of an inherited method. For example, let's put a method in the employee class that can be called when we want to pay a hard-working employee a bonus. Notice how the employee is calling its own calculate monthly pay method and then getting 10% of this. If a permanent employee gets a bonus, it will always be 10% of their monthly pay. This method is now automatically inherited by the casual employee, and the casual employee's bonus method will call its own calculate monthly pay method, so the casual employee's bonus will be 10% of their rate of pay multiplied by the number of hours they work. Let's quickly check. Beatrix earned a bonus of £208. Again, we could do with formatting that. Mervyn, on the other hand, earned a bonus of £24. That's working fine. Now, let's suppose that a casual employee could also be paid a fixed amount of, say, £5, rather than a proportion of their monthly wage. Let's take a look at the front end. And notice that the casual employee has got two versions of the bonus method. One with a parameter and one without. Lucky Mervyn. Again, you can see multiple forms of an object, namely an employee, behaving differently. Polymorphism is exemplified by a subclass overriding or overloading an inherited method. Here's an updated diagram. Notice that bonus appears in the superclass and the subclass, but the fact that the method signatures are different means that an inherited method is being overloaded 
rather than overridden.